we're going to give away a copy of Damon's book. So oh, cool, man. If, if you haven't, <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to give away my actual personal copy of the coffee bean um, because I want to pass it on. It's such a great book. So we're going to give a copy of the coffee bean away. Um, we'll do that in, in our monthly giveaway. You know, of course, George, you don't have to. Yes. George, don't, don't do that. What I'll do is I'll send you a signed copy to give away. How about that? That'll be great. Yeah, we can do yeah. that. That's even better. So Damon's going to send us a signed copy and, and we'll and we'll give away a signed copy of the, of the coffee bean this month. We'll, we'll do both books, man. The change agent and the coffee bean. We'll yes, do. absolutely. And um, we'll do this and, book too. And, and, I, and I was going to get into that in a second. We're actually calling the, the chat today, um, doubling down on culture, the change agent. And, and when I first got into it with uh, with Damon and wanted to meet Damon, I wanted to learn about the coffee bean. And, and Damon said, he said, look, I'm not trying to sell books, but for you to understand the coffee bean, you really need to read the change agent. And so I did. I read the change agent. And I will just tell you that that book is phenomenal. And, and, and what Damon has gone through to get to where he's at and, and where he's at is just it's just really impressive. So without further ado, man, just kind of take it away and let's let's have a little chit chat. Absolutely. Man. Th- and George, first of all, like we talked a while ago, thank you for being persistent and being patient more than anything, because the, these are some things you control. There's not many things you control in life, but the way you look at a situation, the way you view it and what you do next, those are things you control. And you've done it really well, man. You've given me the opportunity to come on your show finally i've been wanting to do this for so long <laughs> finding the right time to do it um like you said I, my life has been it's been busy but not too busy to get things done so finally we're here and i'm very grateful for it uh you talked about culture a while ago and, and culture trumps everything man culture is the thing that a, 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 a program has to have you know people ask me all the time about all these coaches I get to meet and, and, and I've been blessed, George, I get to meet all of these guys, man. The, yeah. the, the, the Dabo Sweeney's and Nick Saban's and all those people like that of the world. But probably more than anything, I've, I've gotten closer to Dabo than anybody else. And I've got to see up front and close the culture there at Clemson. He's changed the way they believe over there, George. And that's, that's the difference, man. I mean, it's, you know, I, I was reading John Gordon's book, power of positive leadership. And mm-hmm. I read a story in there that I'd never known before. And he said, when Dabo started out coaching at Clemson, uh, we first got the head coaching job. He wanted a flat screen TV in his office. And the athletic director told him, well, it's just not the budget. Sorry, Dabo. So Dabo went to Walmart or wherever and bought himself a flat screen TV. Today, they've got flat screens all over Clemson's, head, Clemson's headquarters, which is, I mean, just this immaculate mothership of right. that everybody else compares their facilities to. There's flat screens everywhere, George. But in Dabo's office, Dabo still has his flat screen from when the one he had bought by that time. It's kind of a reminder. He's a very humble guy, but culture is everything. And when I was growing up, I didn't, I didn't latch on to that kind of stuff, George. I was naturally a gifted athlete, um, but I didn't get, I didn't get into the the positive leadership side that I could have. I don't know what my teammates would have really known Damon West to be like had I known all this stuff back then. And I, I wish I'd been able to absorb it. I was a really good athlete, really good quarterback, but I didn't have that side of being a leader yet. Yeah, and and I, and I know when you read the book, you talk about it, and and, and you, it, it's almost like you played with a chip on your shoulder. You know, you you were the best yeah. athlete in the building, you know, but you were you know undersized, and you didn't understand why you know this school weren't looking at you in that school, and and I, and we deal with that on a daily basis now. Um, you know, all these kids they want to be in certain places and they want to do certain things. They want to go to the Clemson's and, but, but, you know, coach Sweeney would love to take a hundred kids a year, but the NCAA yeah. says he can only have 25. And, and, and sometimes those guys who, who aren't in that 25, they feel like it's a bad thing. I mean, it's not a bad thing to go to Appalachian state, which we're no. in a, we're in a bowl game today. So I'm really excited. You know, my gosh, my guy, Sean Clark, just got the head coaching job up there. He was a teammate of mine in college. So I'm really excited for Sean and, and, and what, can't wait to watch them play tonight in New Orleans. But, um, you know, just having the opportunity to play at the next level and, and to get a free education, you know, sometimes guys scoff at that. And, and you know, it's, it's about having a chip on your shoulder and, and not maybe understanding what it really means. And, but that's also being young. Yeah, you know, George, you talk about playing the chip on my shoulder. So you read the book thoroughly. You get it, man. I did. Yeah. I played – with a chip on my shoulder, you know, being a 5'10 quarterback in 1994, coming out, you know, my senior year was 93s, <clears throat> my graduate 94. But back then, no one wanted short quarterbacks. This was this was before, you know, 
Johnny Manziel and Drew Brees and all these other guys. Oh, yeah, you, you and I graduated the same year. I was the short offensive lineman nobody wanted, even though I was good enough. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, so if I had a dollar for everybody said if you were three inches taller. You know, there was a coach that came to visit. This We can get into some interesting stories that, that aren't in the book. Is I got a visit from a coach from New Mexico, and uh, his name was uh, – God, I'll think of his name while we're talking. But Co- Coach Schultz, Bob Schultz. Bob Schultz came to visit me, and uh, he came in the fr- he saw me wearing boots, and I never wore cowboy boots, George. This is not I'm not I'm not a guy that wears Wranglers and stuff like that, so that wasn't ever my thing. But I wanted to be a few inches taller when these coaches came in doing recruiting stuff when they visit the school. First thing he did, he looked at me, he said, "Get out of those boots, Wes. Let's measure you." I'm like, "Oh man!" I mean, just right off the bat, the whole energy in the room changed. Yeah. Everything changed, and all these coaches out. Found out that I was five foot ten instead of six foot one. My dad was a sports writer for fifty years, so my father understood how how it all worked. He was a you know he did freelance work for SI USA Today stuff like that. So he was around coaches all his life, and so he understood how it worked. He's about six three. My older brother's six three. My mother's you know pretty tall. So we thought I was going to grow. So we sent highlight films out when I was a junior in high school. I had an amazing junior year, too. We sent highlight films out that said I was 6'1 or 6'2. I can't remember what it said. <laughs> but, man, everybody <clears throat> in the fit. I'm talking about Miami, Florida State, Georgia. Georgia had a guy named Zaire back then. Eric Zaire yeah. was a real good quarterback. Um, but, I mean, all these the biggest passing schools in the country, UCLA, all these schools are heavily recruiting me. But when it comes time, when the rubber meets the road, when they all found out that I was 5'10", I mean, people just – just it vanished it all dried up it was like i had some kind of incurable disease and nobody wanted me around their team and i was i was pissed george i was mad i went to north texas with a giant chip on my shoulder and and i never looked at north texas at that time as the opportunity that it really was and yeah. uh, and that's what i tell kids about all the time you know no not everybody can play for clemson or alabama or georgia and all these big schools university of texas but if you get the opportunity to extend your career four more years, you're doing what 95% of the people don't ever get a chance to do, you know? Mm-hmm. So you need to be grateful for what you have and, and take advantage of every opportunity you have. So t- talk a little bit about what happened to you and, and, and how you ended up getting here. Cause like I said, I've read the change agent and, and I, and I understand kind of what happened according to the book and, and you're very honest about what you've done and, and, and that's the thing about it. I, I think that's what brings credibility to you and, and why everybody wants to hear your story, because you don't blame anybody for what happened to you but yourself. And, and then you and, but you also talked about, I guess, the whole seminal moment of the book is, is after you get you know, in trouble or whatever, your mom and dad get a chance to speak to you before you get sent off. And it was what your mother said to you. Yeah, man. So it, it's interesting. Yeah. You talk about that aspect of it, of, of, of taking ownership. I was talking to my wife and her friend Megan this morning about this very thing, this very concept of uh, having to own everything you do. And as humans, man, that's tough. I mean, nobody that I I run into is 100% at at owning everything they do just on their own. I mean, when they're what now I've seen a lot of people and I try to be a hundred percent when someone points it out, then you own it after that. But even then sometimes I fail and stumble, but in the book, the change agent, I thought the only way to do this book, if I was going to do it right is to fall on the sword, own everything I've done, uh, and it even tells stories, George, that no one would even know about. Like when you read in the book about when I was on meth and my grandmother got sent up to me after Hurricane Rita destroyed my parents' house in Port Arthur, they sent my grandmother to me in Dallas. Um, you know, I wasn't able to take care of myself. That's the biggest failure in my life, George. And if I don't put that in that book, no one knows about that but my family. My family was even kind of hesitant about adding yeah. that into the book. But I told my parents that in the publisher – that I believe that people need to see the, the ugly side of addiction. You need to see how bad it really got because yeah. addiction affects everybody in this country, George. I mean, whether you're the addict going through it or you're the family member, I put my family through hell, or you're the victim of the addict's crimes um, because I, I made a lot of victims out there, or you're just a taxpayer paying into an overburdened criminal justice system that doesn't know how to handle the disease of addiction. It affects everybody. And so I wanted everybody to see that aspect of it. And for me to do that, I had to own some things publicly that uh that what no one ever asked me to do that but i figured it would be the best way to convey that message so my life you know it goes back to growing up in port arthur i had I had a wonderful life you know my my dad uh bob west is sports writer so bob my dad was 
you know, he was a young up and coming sports writer in, in the early, in the late sixties. He and my mom met at college at Lamar university. He was writing for the newspaper. there, playing golf up there. My mom was a cheerleader. They met, but in 1970, they got married in 68, 1971. My mom was teaching home economics and my dad was a sports writer and the sports editor. I mean, not sports, the publisher of the paper, a guy named Bill Maddox, who went on to become my godfather four years later. Bill came to my dad one day and said, hey, look, I just, you know, I think he had just fired the sports editor there because the sports editor wouldn't do what he had just asked him to do. And he said, Bob, we've got the best running back in the country in our backyard, but the rules say, the rules in quotes, say that you can't put a black athlete on the front page of a football section. You can't put black athletes on the front page of the newspaper here in Port Arthur. He said that rule has changed. He said, this guy, Joe Washington, the best running back in the country, is going to get the front page every time he deserves it. And he said, if you're not the one that's going to do it, then let me know so I can go to the next man. And my dad was like, hey, I'm in. Right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. But my, my godfather warned you. He said, everything you know in this world, not everything, he said, but most of the stuff you know in this world is going to change the minute you do this. I want you to understand that. But my wife and I will be in that same boat with you. We'll be paddling with you. And George... The first time it happened, the first time they put Joe Washington, it was the first week of the season. I think he had a 400-yard game. Uh, everything changed. My dad started getting that hate mail. I mean, they were breaking my parents' windows. Uh, my dad got his tires slid at different times. People were so up in arms about this. But my dad held on to that hate mail from 1971 and beyond because he wanted his sons, my older brother, my younger brother, and I, to see what taking a stand means in life, to do the right thing. Uh, so I, I tell people all the time about that story. And my mom, my mom went on to teach in an all-black uh, school in Beaumont, Texas, where she was one of three white teachers and because they got totally immersed in civil rights. But I tell people that all the time to let people know that, look, where my story goes, I didn't come from a broken home or, or a family that didn't teach me right from wrong. They did. They taught me right from wrong on a higher level because of the civil rights movement, what they were thrusted into themselves. Right. So I got that upbringing. But actually, it saves my life because where I'm going to go in life into prison and the racial overtones that are in prison, not overtones, race runs the entire institution of prison. That's the, that's just the way it is everywhere you go. But it was almost like I was impervious to it because of how I was raised and where I was raised. You know, yeah. Port Arthur is a, a giant blue collar town. It's uh, predominantly African-American when I grew up there. Um, a lot of the white families moved out in the 70s and 80s. They call it the white flight. But my parents dug in their hills and stayed. They wanted their kids to go to integrated schools, and, and we did. And so I was always one of the only white kids at summer parties, birthday parties, on the sports teams. But that was just the world that I knew. And, and thank God for that, because like I said, later on in life, it's going to save me. So we had a great, I had a great upbringing. My mom was one of these devout Catholic mothers that had prayer plaques and crosses all over the house. We were at church every Sunday. My dad was there with us, even though he wasn't Catholic, still isn't Catholic, but he was there every Sunday and every sacrament that we would do. When I was nine, it was 1985, uh, same time you were nine, obviously yeah. the same age. Yeah. Um, I was sexually molested by a babysitter. And so this, and it was a female babysitter. So they didn't do as much about it back then as they do now. I mean, they, back then the police said, hey, it's a female, your son's a male. Not really anything we can do about it. And I tell people all the time, this molestation thing doesn't just throw my world upside down. Like, oh my God, this happened to me. What it does is it introduced me into adult behaviors at nine years old. <laughs> that a nine-year-old doesn't need to be introduced to. And, and so I started looking for other adult behaviors. By the time I was 10, I started drinking. I started putting in chemicals to change the way I felt. I liked the way it felt to get in my dad's beer or go to friends' houses, get in their parents' liquor cabinets. And I've been doing this on my own. I started smoking when I was 10. Started smoking pot when I was 12. But the worst part about this is that I've got a bad belief system. And, and as a coach, George, you tell kids all the time, and all the other coaches that listen to this, you beat into kids all the time that he's bad belief system. The worst part about this is the longer you do something over and over again, the more of a habit that becomes, right? So if you do something over and over the wrong way, that's going to be the way you know how to do things. And, and turning a bad belief system around, look, man, the longer you hold on to one of these things, the harder they are to get rid of, you know? And bad belief systems, I've found out, usually went out in the end. It's hard to retrain your brain to do something the right way after you've done it wrong for so long. So, yeah. I've got this bad belief system that, hey, all I'm doing is drinking a little beer, smoking a little pot. I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not even hurting myself. And um, I take this with me through life. I've got a lot of character issues. But I also have the bad belief system that, hey, man, as long as I'm a quarterback and I'm, you know, I'm the big man on campus, I can get away with anything because this is reinforced over and over again. I, I get in trouble a lot. I skip school. I get in fights. 
But I mean, hey, I'm the star quarterback, right? So I don't get, I don't ever feel the repercussions that anybody else would. I remember this is another story. When I was in high school, the head coach, Coach Owens, found out that I was going across the border to Louisiana to drink and, and club. I'm like 17, 16, 17 years old. And he pulls me aside. He's like, hey, man, I'm getting reports from all these people that you're out there partying and drinking and getting in fights at these clubs in Louisiana. He said, man, you got to knock this stuff off. You're the, the stuff out. You're the starting quarterback. But, man, it was just in one ear and out the other, George. I never saw yeah. that. was, yeah. you know, these were empty threats because what are you going to do, bench me? And so I got a scholarship to play ball at University of North Texas, even though it's not where I wanted to be. I thought I was going to be at Florida State, at Georgia, at Florida. Steve Spurrier was writing me handwritten letters back then, you know. In fact, when I went to speak at University of Florida's football team, I brought that with me, hoping I'd run into Spurrier. But uh, it never materialized. <laughs> I never saw him. But when I got to college, George, and I'm six hours away from home in Denton, um, there's really no, no safety net around me anymore. You know, no community, no head coach like – Coach Owen saying, hey, I'm getting these reports about it. You're on your own once you're in college. You've got a football program. You've got, you know, you've got tutors. You've got the education staff around you. But, man, all I, all I really wanted to do in college was be the starting quarterback and party. You know, I did yeah. both really well. Got into a fraternity, landed the guy <clears> alpha, <throat> uh, partied a lot, chased girls, did all the things that, that you know, really are antithetical to, to getting a good college education, a good college experience. <laughs> and, uh man, I went on to become the starting quarterback by the time I was 20 years old. So here I am thrusted into the spotlight that I've been wanting all the time. Oh, looks like I lost you there, coach. George, you there? Yeah, I can, I can hear you fine. <clears throat> okay. The video, the video shut down. So, um, but here I am thrust into the spotlight at 20 years old. And I thought I had arrived, man. I thought I was a pretty special guy. But I found out about these things called fork in the roads in life. And it was September 21st, 1996, the first time I get this real big lesson in a fork in the road. And a fork in the road is these days that life knocks you down so hard, George, that when you get back up, the world looks different. Yeah. But you've got a choice to make. Am I going to go the right path and go down the right road, or am I going to make the wrong choices and go down the wrong way? Against Texas A&M, September 21st, 96, man. Beautiful Saturday afternoon at College Station, Texas. We take the field. Man, all my family is there. I've got family from all over the state of Texas that's there. My mom and dad are in the stands. And I'm getting out there. I'm warming up. You know, R.C. Slocum is a good friend of my father's. I'm talking to R.C. before the game, hanging out with Dat Wynn and those guys. And, man, the third play of that game, I go down. I separated my shoulder on Kyle Field that day. And I never played college football again. And at that fork in the road, at that point in life, it's what I like to call an existential vacuum. And that's not my own term. I borrowed that term from a guy named Victor Frankl. And I read his, his books in prison. Uh, I don't know if you've ever read any Victor Frankl or some of the coaches mm -hmm. out there have. Uh, Man's Search for Meaning is, is, I think, the name of the book. I, I read so many books. I'm trying to think if that's the exact title. Uh, but Victor Frankl talks about the existential vacuum. And the existential vacuum is when your, your existence is wrapped up in something and it becomes a void. You know, So my existence was, was wrapped up and being the starting quarterback, being the star quarterback, being the big man on campus. And, man, once that was gone in the breath of one play, I didn't have any identity anymore. And I didn't yeah. like who I was. I didn't like being Damon West, just an average college student, uh, without the glory attached to it. And I got into the hardcore drugs. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, I had a chance to coach uh, Aaron Curry in high school. And Aaron is a buck as a winner and he first round draft pick. And, and he came back and talked to the kids one time and for me. And one of the things that Aaron said that always said to me, he said, you know, I'm, I'm not a football player. Football is what I do. It's not who I am. Right. And I think that's kind of what you're talking about is you have to find a balance into so many of us when we were at that age and, and we, we want to play. And I guess this is kind of what we share with our kids is, is the fact that football being everything is not a good thing. <laughs> no, it's a terrible thing. It's, just, it's a stupid idea as a concept. I mean, but that's, I mean, I was a very, look, George, I, I pull no punches about this in my book or in life. Man, I've been a very immature person most of my life. I think arrested development hit me about the age 13. I mean, I think mentally and emotionally, I quit developing at that age. And I, I don't ever mature until I get to prison and I get into a, a program of recovery. And, you know, program recovery, I think every addict needs that. But I needed it as much more than anybody else because the program of recovery taught me how to get outside of myself and quit being selfish and start valuing uh, things in life that are important, like relationships. 
man, right. relationships are the most important thing that we we have in life. But man, you couldn't tell me anything at 20 years old. You couldn't tell me anything at 21. You know why? Because I knew it all. I knew everything. Yeah. So when I go into these rooms with these athletes, I talk to them very directly. I said, hey, I'm looking for the next Damon, for the Damon West out there in the room. The guy in the back that's sitting there thinking, hey, this guy can't tell me anything. What's he know that I don't know, you know? Yeah. But that was my mindset through life. Um, so I was going to ask you that, how you how you approach that when you walk into the room, you know, when you when you walk into Alabama or Clemson or one of these colleges and you get in there and you got these guys and, you know, the coaches made them be there. And and, and then at the end of the talk, you see somebody like Jalen Hurts, who's so excited to see you when he comes to Oklahoma because you heard he heard you at Alabama. And yeah. it's, you know, how, how, how do you approach that 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 piece where these guys are really skeptical at first? You know, I don't know if they're, they're so much skeptical now. I think at the beginning, when I first started doing it, one of the things that, that I ask these coaches to do all the time is because I know these guys, for the most part, don't know who I am. And that's changed a little bit, being connected to John Gordon. Look, John's put me in a different atmosphere in life. I mean, he has raised yeah. me up to a different level of my career, of my ability to, to get through to people. I, I thank John all the time. I, may, I think I make him uncomfortable with how much I thank him, you know? <laughs> but John has done more for me in that aspect that people have started knowing who I am in some of these programs when I come in. And I'm going in every couple of years, every three years. But I ask these coaches all the time, don't say anything about my background, about prison and all that. I even ask them, if you can, don't even tell them who the speaker's going to be so they can't Google. And so when I come in, you know, it's this little bitty five foot, we'll say 10 and a half these days. I'm going to claim that half inch. So this little five, 10 and a half white guy comes in and, and you know, says, hey, you know, I'm really excited to be here. And, you know, a lot of these coaches, I'll ask them for who the leaders are on the team. And, I, and I'll, I'll throw those leaders' names out. So it really personalizes them there. So immediately these guys are like, well, this guy knows who we are, you know, whether it's Clemson or whether it's, you know, University of Toledo or, or whatever, if it's, you know, University of Texas Permian Basin, I'm going to try to find out who the leaders are and let them know that, hey, look, I've done some research on y'all. I'm, I'm here with you. But I jump in right away and start telling the story of a SWAT team takedown. And that usually removes any kind of doubt in everybody's mind because now they're like, wow, what just happened? I mean, this guy's talking about smoking meth on the couch with his meth dealer and, his, and a flashbang grenade coming through his window. Yeah, all the stolen goods in another apartment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this is like – this is the introduction to Damon West. They're getting, and they're, they're locked in, George. They're locked in. I've got them from then on out. And they go for a ride in this story. I try to tell them the story in about 45, 50 minutes. And I have a presentation with videos and PowerPoints, and, but stuff to let, you know, to keep them engaged along the way. And by the time it's over, the Q&A that goes on, uh, you know that the room is totally bought in on. And that's, and that's important. That's powerful. The first time I spoke at Clemson, in 2017, Dabo came up to me afterwards. He's like, he's like, Damon, I've never seen my team react to a speaker like that before. He said, man, they asked questions for 20 minutes. He said, we had to shut the, Q we had to shut the Q and a down. Sorry. That's, that's Mary. That's our little Yorkie. Hey, well, um, Baxter's outside or you'd hear him too. <laughs> what kind of dog is it? He's an Aussie. An Aussie. Okay. Yeah. He's yeah, a six month old Aussie shepherd and he thinks he runs things and he does. Oh, well, Mary thinks she runs things too. She's a six, she's a six pound Yorkie. And I mean, but but with her bark, you would think she's 130 pounds. I mean, she's no doubt. she's she's vicious is, is behind the door. But so, but Dabo was like, "Hey, man, look, I've never seen my team respond like that." He said, "We had to shut the Q and A down." He said, it, it, "He said it's the most amazing story I've ever heard." He said, "What? He said, Let me do something to help you." He said, "You know, have you been to Alabama yet?" And I laughed at him. I'm like, "Dabo, you know how hard it was for me to get into to Clemson, man." I, I, I'll tell you the story about how I got into Clemson. It's a story I tell businesses all the time. But um, I said, Dabble, I don't, I don't know how to get in touch with Alabama. He said, well, we'll see what happens. He said, I just texted Nick Saban from the back of the room. He said, I told, I told Nick Saban what I was witnessing. When I landed in Houston, Texas the next morning, I had a voicemail and a text message from the director of football operations at Alabama that said, hey, we'll see you in Tuscaloosa in three weeks. You're on. I mean, just like that, Dabble. Yeah. And then – so – but he <clears> saw – what all these other coaches see that somebody comes in that's got, you know, a currency to spend with the, with these athletes. I mean, so the currency is that, Hey, I've set what you've set before, you know, what you're doing has been done before. And I did it too. I mean, I, I didn't do it on the level of, I tell them all the time. I didn't, I don't play in the spot. Like, like some of these big power five schools, I, we didn't do that. You know, for regular home games, we played a lot of power five schools. I mean, we played 
a schedule my soft my redshirt freshman year of college 1995 i mean it's like oklahoma missouri osu lsu alabama texas right. and I mean, we're but what we're doing we had just gone to division one but that's the currency i have with these guys and they see that and one of the videos that plays in my powerpoint is that that play at texas a&m where i get injured you know so now they're seeing hey this guy really played big time football on some uh, on this level and so they, they lock in they're engaged the right. shared currency gets me in to share this story about the dangers of drugs the consequence of bad decisions the the danger of a bad belief system but also that message of hope hope and perseverance against the greatest odds because like john and i talked about for the coffee bean he was so insistent on writing this book because he said that everybody needs to hear that story the coffee bean because that's a, a relatable way to tell that the power to change any situation is within you, you know, yeah. and these outside influences that we often let, we often allow to change the way we handle stuff. You know, those don't have to, those don't have any control over us unless we give it to them and being, becoming the carrot or the egg. That's a choice. You know, yeah. that's a choice. You don't have to do that. You choose to allow a situation to beat you down. You know, so. Right. So when you when you get to talking about that in terms of, uh, you know, a culture um, and, and how, how do you think? Because what I see now is I see guys wearing coffee bean T-shirts, you know, Clemson coffee beans and all those stuff. And and so you're trying to create a culture of, of, of self-awareness, of ownership, accountability. Um, you know, what are what are what would be some of the other you know catchwords that you probably would use as far as when you talk to these coaches about, hey, this is what you need to have in your program to make it functional. So you talk about like other other catch words that I use. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, one of the things that I talked about with Randy Jackson is, is they actually have a word a day. Like on Monday, they focus on, you know, their energy. You know, we're, we're not going to be energy vampires today. You know, did he use, he, you. Okay. you know, and on Go Tuesday, on. they do attitude. On Wednesday, they do family. And, you know, so, you know, yours, I, I, if I'm thinking about what your your coach, your, your keyboards would be, you know, there would be ownership. There would be, you know, family, obviously. Absolutely. No, so I understand the question now. So one word I would use and, and you know, tell you the story behind it. So I was – meeting with the parole voter, you know, not the parole voter, but the parole board. Right. And she's looking over all my parole. You read the books, so you know, yeah. where going. she's, she's like, you know, Mr. West, we don't see a lot of people come through like you in state prison. You know, you had this amazing life and all these opportunities, George. I mean, I worked, I played quarterback in college. I worked in Congress. I worked for a guy running for president, raising money all over the country. I worked on wall street. Yeah. She's looking at my background. She's like, Oh my God, you had all this stuff going on in life. Then you, get into substance abuse you commit all these crimes you get all this time but then you come in here and you transform yourself and the prison around you she said i got one question for you she said if you could be remembered for being anything in this life she said give it to me in just one word go and because i bought into the coffee bean concept because i had bought into the whole idea of spirituality of of surrendering and, and allowing god to drive that car and i'm just a passenger in it Man, I had her answer for it, George. I fired it off right back at the same speed. Bam, like that. I said, ma'am, useful. I just want to be useful. I said, yeah. I can be useful in here in this prison, or I can be useful out there in the free world. And and um, that had an impact on her. I mean, she 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 even told me, she said, that, that's an amazing answer. So useful is one of those words, I would tell you. It's a key word. Another key word would be a combo word of servant leadership. You know, yeah. servant leadership – that servant leadership is huge, George, because that's really the secret to life. And once I didn't have a, an understanding of comprehension of servant leadership. Now, look, I tell these stories about my background, but I wasn't always, uh, you know, selfish. I did things for other people, but servant leadership was a concept that, that wasn't available to me emotionally, maturity wise, spiritually, until I got removed from everything else in life. This is prison, you know. Then I learned servant leadership because I'm at a place where I'm at the lowest. I'm at rock bottom and I'm looking for, for help along the way. And I tell people all the time that, that people in life want to be led, you know, mm -hmm. and that's generally the way it is. Not everybody's leaders. Very few people are leaders, George. Right. But in the absence of good leadership, people will follow a bad leader. It's yeah. like a thirsty man in the desert. You know, if that guy in the desert just stumbles around enough and he's thirsty enough and he sees a mirage, he'll drink the sand. And the sand will kill him every time. And that's what we do when we follow a bad leader. We, we, we destroy ourselves from the inside. It's almost as if we drank that sand and it eats us from the inside out. So 
Servant leadership, though, is, is when we get outside of ourselves and we decide, that, hey, we're going to look for opportunities to help other people out in life, you know, because servant leadership is raising other people up to a different station of life, helping other people achieve their goals. I use the example all the time of a guy named Joe Totoris. And you've read the books. So you know who Joe is. Joe graduated from Texas A&M in 1970 with a business degree. He moved back to Beaumont, Texas, where we live. Where I, I live in the Beaumont area. <clears throat> And in 1976, he started a little sandwich shop. And this little sandwich shop had four employees, had one store. And today, Jason's Deli has over 12,000 employees. It's got over 300 stores. They're in over 30 states in the United States. Oh, trust me, my girlfriend's favorite restaurant. Oh, my God. Well, <laughs> there all the time. It's my she, favorite restaurant. And she, my, she, she adores it. My, I'm like, can my, we go anywhere but Jason's Deli? You no. sound like my wife. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> no, it literally is. She 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 adores it. Yeah, she my wife loves Jason's Deli too, just not as much as I do. So right. um and I, I and I try to go to Jason's Deli's everywhere I am in the country too. Yeah, I was at I was at in Ohio at, in at Wright State University, a little small school in, in Ohio, um in Dayton, Ohio, a couple weeks ago. And so these coaches get me in and I'm and I'm there because the guy that gave me a job out of prison guy named Chris Kirchman at this law firm where I work, this lawyer, his stepson is one of the baseball coaches there at Wright State. It's his first D1 coaching job. So I told Chris, I said, you know, when Trevin can get it worked out, I said, I want to go and speak to Trevin's school. I want, I want Trevin to be able to bring something in they wouldn't normally be able to bring in, you know, John Gordon's co-author, you know, and I don't mind going through life as being John Gordon's co-author. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I went in there and so the coaches there, they wanted to take me out to a nice meal. They're like, hey, man, we've got these restaurants. Out here. Starting to, I said, do y'all have a Jason's Deli? They're like, yeah, but you sure you want to go there? And I'm like, and I told them the story I'm about to tell you. <laughs> so Joe, Joe starts this little restaurant up called Jason's Deli, a little sandwich shop. And, and then today it's huge. So Joe, I met Joe through prison ministry stuff. And Joe, Joe just passed away in August. He did. And he and yeah. I became very close, but Joe... Man, you can find Joe every Monday night inside the Mark Styles unit, the maximum security penitentiary in Beaumont, where I, I served my time. Joe didn't measure his life by the accumulation of wealth or his business acumen or the things he had. He didn't collect a lot of things either. I mean, he had he had infinite wealth to do whatever he wanted to do. Like every Monday night, you could find him inside the Mark Styles unit ministering to men. And and when he get, got a chance, he would go on these four days retreats. And these four day retreats inside the prison or where I learned this, about servant leadership. Joe explained to me servant leadership one time. He said, Damon, in the early 90s, Jason's Deli, you know, we were making money, but the business wasn't doing as good as, as, good as it could be. He said, I wasn't happy in my, my home life. He said, things just weren't growing great in life. He said, but in 19, I think it was 1995, March 2nd, 1995, he was at Texas A&M. They had a speaker come into the business school, a guy named David Glass. And David Glass, for those of y'all that don't know the name, because why would you? David Glass was Sam Walton's handpicked successor at Walmart. He was the first CEO of Walmart after Sam Walton stepped down in, I think, 87 or 88. And David Glass came in, and he, his whole presentation was built around the, the term servant leadership. And this floored Joe. Joe was like, you know, how do you even put those two words together? Because in Joe's mind, a servant was someone that carried the towel, pushed the broom, did these menial tasks. Yeah. And he said when he understood, when he finally got what servant leadership is, he changed his entire business model. He said because in business, he said he did what he was taught in business school and what he thought business was about, which is chasing down every dollar you can, making all the money you can, the almighty dollar ran everything. But he said after that, he changed his mindset to taking care of his employees. He said my employees became my priority and making sure my employees did everything in life and making sure that he had the right opportunities, the best health care plans, the best hourly wages to make sure his employees could reach their goals in life. He said, because everybody has dreams. And if you help nourish those dreams, and you help become a part of the solution for them, finding them. He said, they'll take care of your, they'll take care of your customers. He said, so everybody that says, well, my customers are the most important. They're missing the boat. Your employee yeah. in your coaching profession, your athletes are the most important thing. Your, your assistant coaches, the other coaches you coach with, this is your family. And he made Jason's Deli a family. And, and, and it's funny because, the people that go work for Jason's Deli, they stay there for 20, 25, 30, 35 years. When I go in these other towns, like when I was in Dayton, Ohio, I went and asked for the manager. Hey, hey, man, how long have you been here? You know what? I always ask for the general manager and say, how long have you worked at Jason's Deli? It's always the same answer too, George. 
you know, 25 years, 20 years, 18 years. And Joe would laugh. He said, people always ask me, where are you finding your employees? And he would laugh. And he said, the same place everybody else is. But it's what happens when they get on the inside that is the difference. It's the culture, George. And I can't say the word culture enough because these men, these Joe Tortoises, these Davos Winnies that understand culture, uh, they do it on a different level. And players want to play for them and do things for them that they wouldn't normally do for other people because of the culture. They belong to it. So where, where did you come up with the word uh, or the title, the change agent? So we tossed around, George, naming a book is one of the hardest processes. Oh, yeah, it is. I'm writing one right now, so trust me, I know. <laughs> I mean, I wanted to call it The Good Thief, you know, after the, the guy that died on the cross next to Jesus, Dismas is his name, yeah. uh, The Good Thief on the Cross. I wanted to call it The Good Thief, but my, my publisher, my literary agent, like, we don't want the word thief anywhere near this title. So, yeah. um, but The Change Agent, uh, which is one of those one of those names that was thrown out. It was thrown out early on, and then we eventually came back to it because we went for a month back and forth with naming the book. Uh, but it, it eventually came out to be the change agent. Um, and my dad came up with the subtitle um, because, you know, the original subtitle, I can't remember what it was, uh, how one man changed his world or something like that. It's just <laughs> that is so generic. But, you know, my dad being a, a sports guy, he wanted, you know, he wanted the word quarterback in there and, college quarterback and so uh that's what we ended up going with so it was it was a process to name that book and i'm working on the third book right now and i'm not even stupid enough to try to think it. i know what it's going to be named at this point <laughs> i have no clue what the third book's going to be well named. if it's as it's good as the first two it, it, it doesn't matter what it's called uh you know i could i could talk to you for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and uh but, you know, like I said, I, I just wanted a chance to kind of expose you to, to some of the guys who, who are, uh, you know, part of the, the mesh group. And, you know, we, we have a little podcast we've started now, so we'll upload this on the podcast. And we just wanted to live stream it on the YouTube. And um, <clears throat> so some of the guys who may not know who you are, um, you know, I wanted them just to be exposed to you so they could read those things because – I think just like you were talking about, uh, and I don't know that the, you ever named the old man in, that you met at the jail who told you about what prison was going to be like. I just know that he was an older black gentleman. I don't know if you ever said his name in the book or not. Um, but that man, the you know, the Joe, you know, the Joe Jason's Deli guy, was it Tosa Terror? Tutorius, 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 yeah, him. Um, you know, those three or four people who who come in your life and they actually are change agents. Even, even yeah. if they don't, you know, intend to be, um, you know, I think are important. So I know when I read your book, you know, it started making me think about different things. And, um, you know, I'm at a stage in my life where, you know, difficulties make you make difficult decisions. And, and you can, and like you said, you can be a carrot, you can be a, an egg, or you can be a coffee bean. And, and so your book came to me at the right time. And so I'm just trying to pay it forward and do the same thing. Because I know when I coach at the college level, I had a lot of guys, you know, who were from, you know, some of the roughest parts of the country, you know, the South Memphis, the Atlanta, the Mobile, Alabama, oh, yeah. you know, places where I couldn't imagine growing up from. And, and one of the things that those guys told me was, you know, coach, if it wasn't for my coach in, in high school, I wouldn't be in college. No. And, and so I always said that when I went back to the high school level, I wouldn't talk to kids about getting to college anymore. I would talk to them about what are they going to do to stay there? Because too many times, you know, we get to that destination. Oh, I have arrived. You know, I got to North Texas and I arrived and then right. the work stops. And then, you know, two semesters later, you're, you're sent home because you didn't go to class or you're in jail or, you know, all these other things. And, and so, you know, for me, I, I'm trying to figure out ways to, to encourage kids to do different things and to think in the bigger picture. And we're in such a immediate gratification um, society now. And, and, and that's why um, when I was talking the other day about having you on the channel with somebody, I was like, man, I thought you were going to do that back in August. I was like, man, you just got to be patient. It's worth it. And it is worth it. And I, and I want you to know, I really appreciate you coming on and, and just chit chatting because, you know, we didn't really talk a lot about, you know, football per se, but we talked about life, and, and I think football for us is the greatest vehicle to drive kids through life if we do it Absolutely. the right way. Absolutely. You know, so you said a lot there, you know, to unpackage some of the stuff you just said. Let me put it to you in, in a way that you're saying the same thing to me that Nick Saban said to me because Nick Saban said the same thing. All these other coaches, 
the Tom Hermans, all these other coaches say exactly what you just told me, man. Because when I go in to talk to a football program, the last thing I'm doing is talking to these guys about for these head coaches about football, man. These are head coaches in college, man, or head yeah. coaches in high school. What am I going to tell you, man? I don't watch football enough to be able to tell you about spread offense or anything else, read the defense anymore. But we talk about life, man. And they always do the same thing. What can you do to help make these men better, better servant leaders one day? What can you do to make, help make them a better husband one day, a better father, a better brother, a better cousin, a better uncle. What can you do for my men to help them grow spiritually, emotionally, you know? And that's where, that's what it's at because you have this vehicle, you have this opportunity coach to work on these men for this four years that you have them. And Billy Graham had a great quote, great quote that said a, a coach will impact more more lives in one year than the average person will in a lifetime. Never truer words have been spoken because through sports, we have this, this way of communicating that's universal. Dabo told me in August when I was in his office and we were talking about life. We talk, we talk a lot about life. We talk on the phone about life, but he said, you know, Damon, if we could bottle up what we, what we do with these athletes for four years, if we could bottle that up and give it to everybody in America he said we would cure all their ills because for four years you play sports and you don't look at the color of the skin of the guy next to you. You know, you sure. don't look at his ethnicity, his religion, his, his race. You don't care about these things. What you care about is the guy next to you and the guy on your team. And that huddle has your back. and He's going to go to war with you every every single week and in practice every week. And you have his back, too. And that's all you care about. These people in sports don't care about race, do they, George? They don't no, care about no, that. I, and, and, I, and I work in a very diverse community and there's a lot of tension between those communities sometimes. But when, when, when the game is on, everybody gets along. Absolutely, man. These guys become your brothers. But something happens once, once we leave the sports world for some people. Something happens and then we get divided. You know, we, we start breaking up our own groups. I was having a conversation. This is back when I was a fundraiser. And this is in 2002. I'm a political fundraiser in Washington. And I'm not going to say who it was, but it was a former president of the United States that said, you know, we were talking about race in America. And he said, if you want to know how far we have not come with race, he said, go into any elementary school cafeteria in the South and walk in there and watch kids when they eat lunch. He said, you start looking at the ages as they get older, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, they self-segregate. He said, and where do they learn this, man? Where do kids learn to self-segregate? They're not learning it at, at, at school because kids just want to be around other kids. Yeah. But it's something that, that's learned in the home, George. And I think that that's, um, that's something that's a generational deal, something that's going to have to be broken down. And I, I, I'm not sure that race is what you wanted to talk about today, but sports transcends race. And that's the thing, that's the point about it, what Dabba was making and what you see and what I see and all these other coaches on this podcast see that you don't have the same problem that the rest of America has sometimes because you're in a, we're in a bubble, man, of positivity, of football, of, of challenges that come our way and the man next to you doesn't look like you most of the time. And that's yeah. great. And I wish, like Dabo said, we could bottle that up and package it and, and, and sell it to people. But, um, you know, that's something we all have to work on as, as human beings. Well, and, and like I said, that's that's kind of the reason why I wanted to do this. And, you know, you and I had a very similar conversation this summer. And, and you know, and that's, I gave you pretty much the same reasons then as I'm giving you now. And it's yeah. and, and for me, it's it's I'm at a different stage in my life. You know, when I was a 26 year old head coach, all I wanted to do was win state championships and and things like that. But I'm at an age now where I see guys who I've coached who are married now and have kids. And, 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 it, and it means something to me when they look at me and say, you know, that was my high school coach, you know, and, and, and that's really, really important. And so that's, that's the difference that we can make. And I, sometimes I think because we get so wrapped up in competition and, and making money and doing different things in life that we forget about, you know, people and, and having good relationships. And, and I, I'm just, like I said, man, I'm just so excited to have you on guys. If you, like I said, if you haven't seen it, the book is the coffee bean. The other book is the change agent. I don't have a, a hand copy of the, of the change. Agent. I actually read that one on my iPad, but uh, I'm going to send, I'm going to send, I'm going to send both. I'm going to send you a set that, that signed to you and I'm going to send you a set that you can give away. Because yeah, and so so this month on on the website, all you gotta do is go to ninety two community, and this month's giveaway will be a, a signed set of books from Damon, and and that's really really special, man. I really really appreciate that. Um, like I said, you know, guys, look him up on 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 the internet. You can see some stuff. There's some YouTube stuff. His books are great, um, and you know, not only for you know growth of your programs and things like that, but just a lot of personal growth as well. And, and sometimes we forget to take care of ourselves. 
you know, we get so drowned, uh, drowned in the world and winning and X's and O's and all this other stuff that we forget about taking care of ourselves. And, and, and Damon kind of reminds me of that. And he shares his story real frankly. Um, so, you know, like I said, anything you want, any last little words you want to say before I get you back yeah. to your wife and the little girl? <laughs> yeah, man. So here, yeah, you know, she's so sweet. Yeah. But here's the thing, man, I would tell you, it's, it's actually a chapter in my book. You can't give what you don't have. You yes. Know? So if you're not taking care of yourself emotionally, spiritually, and physically, then you're not going to be able to pass it along to anybody else. Mr. Jackson was the guy you're talking about in jail. In county yes. jail. He gave me the, the story about the carrot, the egg, and the coffee bean, you know, using prison as a pot of boiling water. And, and the metaphor for that is life is a pot of boiling water, you know, and a carrot goes in there and becomes soft, you know, an egg goes in a pot of boiling water, becomes hard, but the coffee bean, and like he said, it, it shocked me, the coffee bean, the smallest of these three things, so the coffee bean doesn't have to be big. A coffee bean has a big impact, though, because it changes the pot of warm water to a pot of coffee. And he said, you know, everybody in life puts an energy, negative or positive. He said, whatever kind of energy you put out, you attract back. It's called the law of attraction, George. So if you are negative, you'll attract negative energy. But if you're positive, you attract that positive energy. And in my own life, I'm going to tell you, this worked in a maximum security prison because I attracted other, other coffee beans my way once I became a coffee bean. And in my life now, I mean, we talk about Dabos and all these other coaches and Nick Saban and John Gordon. These guys and I are attracted to each other because we have the same energy going out. And so I mm -hmm. would stress, you know, one of the most important things in life is to put that energy out that you want to attract back in your life into your program and to your, your men that you're coaching. Um, and I would also say this one last thing, because this lesson is one I share – do we have about two more minutes? Oh, you got as much time as you want, Coach. I just don't oh. want to hold you up. <laughs> no, no, cool. No, I, but I wanted to make this special. I wanted to talk for as long as I can with you. Sure. As long as you'll have me on because, man, look, I've been wanting to do this show with you since August. You've been so patient and so good. In fact, I'll come on anytime you want. And if you want to do sure. it every year, we'll do it every yeah, year. Yeah, absolutely. But here's the story, man, is the only question you know the answer to is the one you don't ask. And this is, can be applied to anything in life. So here's my story about this. So, um, you know, it's 14 months out of prison. It's January of 2017. Been out of prison 14 months, and I really want to speak to the college football world, but I don't have any way to get in front of these guys. And, man, you know what it is. Coaches are such a tight fraternity. Yeah. Y'all are, and y'all are superstitious. But the one thing about coaches, too, it's it's a very copycat type deal because if a coach says, hey, I see this guy's doing this thing and it works for him, well, you'll adapt that, too, because you want to do what works, right? So, Absolutely. But I can't even get in the door. And so a buddy of mine in Michael Orta is a – He's, he works in the media for KHOU in Houston. So he gets a press pass, an extra press pass for me to what's called the Bear Bryant Coaching Awards. And the Bear Bryant Coaching Award is – the coaches out here, y'all know the Bear Bryant Awards. It's awarded to the best college football coach in America every year in January. It's in Houston. And so he said, I've got a, pre a press pass for you for this deal. It's on a Wednesday night. He said, but I can't hang out with you. You're on your own. He said, but the, et the eight best coaches in college football are going to be there, and uh, good luck. So, man, I get out there and I drive. I live 90 miles from Houston. I put on a suit and I drive on out there. And so I'm talking to all these coaches, man. I, and, and I hit the floor at the Toyota Center running, man. And Penn State, USC, all these – Wisconsin, OU, Stoops is there. So all these coaches I'm talking to, and every single one of them, the door is slamming in my face, George. I mean, these guys don't know who I am. They hear this story, this crazy story. And, and it's an elevator pitch that I haven't even perfected because – I've never had an opportunity to speak to these coaches. So I'm mm -hmm. firing 90 mile an hour conversation at them. They're like, yeah, okay, good. Great. Good story. Yeah. Uh, give us, give us your card. Thanks. You can tell by their body language that I'm striking out left and right, man. I'm seven of the eight coaches down and I'm, I'm over in the corner licking my wounds. I'm ready to quit and go home. And then I think to myself, Damon, what kind of motivational speaker would you be? And what kind of person would you be if you just quit? You know, you survived maximum security prison. You're going to talk to that last coach before you leave. And so I, I got my nerve up and I found my opportunity and I ambushed Dabo Sweeney coming out of the bathroom, man. Jumped on him. And, <laughs> and George, I gave, I gave, Dabo will tell you this day, I gave him 10 minutes of conversation in two minutes. I mean, it was like getting a drink of water out of a fire hydrant. And so, um, and at the end of it, Dabo was like, yeah, you got a card? Give me a card. We'll give you a call. And I saw I reluctantly hand over Dabo my card. And I think, well, you know what? I went zero for eight tonight, but I felt good because I left it all on the field, George. And I drove home the 90 miles to Houston, from Houston, defeated but satisfied that I did everything I could do. And that's what we teach our players, man. Leave right. it all on the field, right? That's the main lesson. 
four months later, I get an email from Mike Dewey, the director of football operations at Clinton. And the email is, where did I get? Hey, Damon, uh, you met Coach Sweeney. Is Coach Sweeney in an awards show? And he'd like to have you come talk to the team. How's August 1st? He'd really like to have you come. And I was reading this email going, oh, my God, the one yes. So it's like I tell people all the time, man, the only question you know the answer to is the one you don't ask. If I'd have left an award show and I wouldn't have talked to Dabo Sweeney and just tried and asked him a question that he could say no to, give him the chance to say no, then I wouldn't have had the opportunities that I have going on in my life right now to enrich the lives of so many people. I wouldn't have been sitting at my desk last August, you know, 15 months ago when John Gordon calls my cell phone and I'm sitting there and he's like, Hey, Damon, it's John Gordon. I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, yeah, right. Who is this? You know, <laughs> I'm like, okay, John, well, how do you even know who I am? I had to get my cell phone number. And he said, Dabo Swing. He said, man, Dabo can't quit talking about you and that coffee bean story that you tell. All these things in life, these, these, some of these encounters that I've had, some of these coffee bean moments where you're putting out positivity and you attract the positivity of other, the other positive people, all that would have been, you know, just a dream had I not just got up to ask that one question and be willing, be vulnerable enough to be told no. Vulnerability, George, is a strength, not a weakness. I tell people this all the time. I saw Dabo get vulnerable in front of his teammates, and I'm not going to go into the situation why I'm this August when I was there, it's a very, very emotional moment for Dabo because of someone that he had in his family that was in that room in front of that team. And Dabo got emotional in front of these guys. And I watched his team respond to him. And they were so drawn to him that after the presentation was over, the players that normally come up and say, what's up to me, give me a high five and stuff like that. They were going up to Dabo, giving Dabo hugs too. And man, I was floored. I was like, man, Dabo was so, he's so vulnerable in front of his guys. They love him, man. They love that vulnerability. I would say to all your coaches, man, be vulnerable. Let those guys get down to their level and know that you can be you can be who you are at the core. And you don't have to be this big, bad guy. You don't have to be someone they fear. Be someone they love, George. Yeah, no doubt. And, and you know, just to piggyback on that, you know, people ask me all the time, how in the world did you get, you know, Damon West to come on the YouTube channel? I sent him a tweet. <laughs> That's it, man. I tell people all the time. I've gone to, like, this coach at UT Permian Basin, man, uh, yeah. Justin Kerrigan, man. Justin sent me a tweet, and and I was like, hey, I'm in. I'm going. You know, he's yeah. like, wow, you, you're you. I'm like, dude, you took the chance. Ask the question. If I can do it, I'm in. Yeah, and I did. I just I just tweeted you, and then the next thing you know, we're, we're talking on the phone, and we had a conversation for the longest time and, you know, just talked and chit-chatted. And, and, and so many times I think people forget that, that we're here to help each other in this world. It's not about being better than other folks and things like that. And, and, and like I said, you know, just having you on the channel today is, you know, football is the reason why, you know, people are going to hear this conversation. And, and I think hopefully it's going to help some people at some point, but, you know, like, I, like I always said, if it just helps one, it was worth it. And, um, you know, who's going to be the next change agent is the big question, you know? Absolutely, man. You said it. you hit it down the head, man. If we could just find, one person in every audience to hit. I mean, you've changed, you've changed their world, which means yeah, you've changed absolutely. the world, you know, every it, it, through one person at a time, George. You're absolutely yeah, Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Like I said, guys, hey, man, I really appreciate you guys being around. Uh, I'm going to let Damon get loose. And my, my voice is bad. I've been I've been had a cold all week, Damon. I feel like I feel horrible. So I'm always talking is killing me. But but uh, I, I'm just so excited that we finally got a chance to chit chat. And I'd love to have you back at some point. Uh, but but guys, like I said, if you don't know about Damon, check him out. Uh, his Twitter handle is at Damon West seven. You know, he, he's active on Twitter all the time. If you tweet him, he'll tweet you back and all that good stuff. And um I know he speaks to a lot of high schools and things like that. And, you know, if that's something maybe you're interested in, hit him up. And, and, and if he can work it out, he'll definitely do it. I mean, he, he really believes all this stuff he says. This is not a this is not a game show for him. You know, this is this is him. You know, it's on his sleeve. And, and I, like I said, I mean, just like that, he's, he's going to send us a copy of of the books, you know, to, to give away. And, that, and that's just that's just him. I didn't ask him about it. We didn't talk about it before the, the conversation or anything. He just he's just that kind of guy. And and Damon, I, I can't thank you enough, man. I really appreciate you. And and I just want you to know that the things that you talk about, they, they weigh heavy on my mind and some of the people. And I used your speech the other day with a kid in my school. You know, oh, wow. I, I talked I talked to him about being a coffee bean the other day because he was upset. And, and, you know, the kids that I work with, they're great kids, but sometimes their coping skills lack. 
And, and, you know, and I just told him, I said, well, you know, buddy, you have three choices in this situation. You can be an egg, you can be a, 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 a carrot, or you can be a coffee bean. And then he kind of looked at me funny. And then we were able to have that conversation and I shared it with him. And then he kind of scratched his head and, you know, oh, I got you, coach. I got you. And, 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 you know, that helped that kid work through. So, so just that little, you know, 70 or 90 pages, or however long it is, it's, yeah, it's like 90 some pages, guys, but I read it in about 30 minutes. I mean, it's a 30 minute read. Um, that's just the little, the little, the little parable part of, of, of Damon's story that, that that's very, very applicable, but the change agent book is a great book. And I'm glad that you made me read that book, Damon. You know, I say you made me read the book, but you said, Hey, if you're going to interview, the interview goes a lot better if you read the book. <laughs> and, and it did, man, George. And, and, and I appreciate you taking the time to do that. That was an event. You invested the most valuable thing you have, which is your time. And you gave yeah. it to, and I'm grateful for that. But yeah, you're right. The interview went a lot better. I didn't have to sit there and recant my entire story uh, yeah. because you didn't know what questions to ask. You know? No. Well, anyway, I, I got, buddy, I really appreciate you. And, and, and next time you go to Mexico, can I get the invite? <laughs> <laughs> Man, look, if it's up to my wife. We're going sooner rather than later. We have to I, drive down to Mexico. I know that's right. Well, hey, listen, hey, guys, also just one last thing. And, and, and Damon's not a braggadocious kind of guy, so I'm going to brag for him. But uh, they've actually, you know, they're actually going to turn that book into a movie and, and, and it's going to be really good. And uh, I can't wait to go see it. I, I think that movie is going to do a lot to change in people's lives as well. We'll see, man. We'll, we'll see. What, I, I'm so like, uh, you know, if it's supposed to happen, it's going to happen. I know that. God well, look, let me talk happen. about it that way. You don't jinx it. <laughs> <laughs> I refuse. to. I know this. I know that I got a text message the other day. I'll share this with you, with you people. I got a text message the other day from the guy uh, that's working with Lionsgate film uh, that they're going to give it to Channing Tatum to look at. So um, we'll see. We'll see if Channing Tatum wants to play the role of Damon West. I think it'd be great. Well, hey, look, I'll, I'll, call, I'll, I'll tweet him right now. And, and, and all he can do is say no. All right, guys, y'all have a great day. And as always, spin it to win. All right, 72. All right, 72.